Well, welcome to Focus Today. I'm your host, Perry Atkinson. And well, today is an interesting day. <laughs> I had no idea that this subject uh, was um, so interesting. Let's put it that way. Uh, for quite some time, as you know, uh, we've had uh, John Mittendorf on. In fact, he'll join us a little bit later on. And we've dealt with the subject of uh, creation versus evolution. And in particular, dealing with the subject of the book of Genesis. And out of that, has come some interesting remarks from various groups of people and most recently a series of emails that have come to me regarding the fact that there is significantly a difference in beliefs on those how they interpret the book of Genesis. And uh, then I come to realize that uh, Catholics believe a little different than some evangelicals and yet a lot of evangelicals believe exactly like the Catholics do when it comes to the literal, the literal interpretation of the book of Genesis. Well, today, I am really honored to have with us a very special person. We've had him on before, and he's back with us. His name is Jimmy Atkins. He is the uh, senior apologist at Catholic Answers, and we're going to be talking to him about uh, his views on this particular subject. So, Jimmy, good to see you again, my friend. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me back. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, where are you? Where are we Skyping you in from? Uh, San Diego, so same coast, but all the way down at the bottom. <laughs> okay, good to see you. Well, I think you got a little bit of an idea why you're with us, and I was uh, thumbing through your blog uh, quickly today uh, mm -hmm. on some of your comments, but the, the real discussion is that apparently there is a difference on the time of <laughs> literal creation, and uh, can you just, for the sake of starting the conversation, what is the Catholic doctrine on uh, the uh, seven-day creation? Okay, um, well, I guess there's a couple of questions there. Um, the Church doesn't have a single mandated interpretation that everybody's expected to, hear, to adhere to. So there is room for a legitimate difference of opinion among Catholics, and if a person believes that the uh, six-day interpretation of Genesis is correct, the Church is not going to insist that somebody abandon that. Um, having said that, that's not the most common interpretation in the Catholic Church, and in fact, the Catechism of the Catholic Church endorses the view that these uh, six days are a symbolic representation of the work of the Creator. So, God really created everything, uh, but because of various factors, the author of Genesis arranged them in the form of a seven-day week, which corresponds to the work, <clears throat> the work week of the ancient Israelites. And so, since Israelites worked for six days and rested on the seventh, as a literary device, the author of Genesis depicted the work of the Creator in the same fashion. And so, we read about God working for six days and then resting on the seventh, in Genesis 1, uh, even though Jesus makes it clear that because God sustains the universe, he didn't just create it, he's actually literally been working the entire time, including on the Sabbath. If he wasn't sustaining the universe on the Sabbath, the universe would cease to exist. So, literally speaking, God works every single day, but uh, in terms of how the work of creation was presented, it was fitted into this framework, because that's what the ancient Israelites used for their own lives. So, if you were going to put more than a literal day in there, what would be the general thinking? You mean in terms of the age of the universe? No, just in the time of creation. If it wasn't a literal seven days, then what could it be then? Well, um, this gets us into matters of science, and there the Church is much more uh, reticent. Uh, the, the Catechism contains a general statement noting with appreciation the work that modern scientists have done on the age and dimensions of the cosmos, but it doesn't teach as a matter of faith something that's properly speaking a matter of science. So it would depend on how you see the scientific evidence. If you think the scientific evidence shows that the Earth and the cosmos developed over over billions of years, then uh, that's permitted for a Catholic to believe. On the other hand, if you think the evidence supports that it was uh, it was developed very quickly, and you think that's what the science shows, then you're free to believe that as well. Okay, I get that part. I'm just kind of, I guess, the reason this has popped up at the level that it has, uh, some are very adamant 
that mm -hmm. that it was longer than a literal seven days and if that is not recognized as the truth it becomes a stumbling block of potential future believers how, how mm -hmm. do i how do i read that into that or how is that read into that well um i'm not sure that i understand the question the 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 tension that exists over the question uh or matters scientific in general is one that goes back centuries. Uh, the ancient Greeks had an early form of science, and as a result, Christians have been dealing with the question of how does science and faith interact ever since the beginning of the Christian age. In fact, St. Augustine, the most famous and influential theologian of the first millennium, uh, he lived in the, uh, in the 400s. Uh, he's famous for having warned Christians not to have an overly dogmatic reading of Scripture that may lead them to say things that, from a scientific perspective, would be regarded as foolish, because that can alienate uh, people who are not yet believers, who may know something about science. And so, uh, if you if you are overly dogmatic about it has to be this way, this is the only possible interpretation, and you're wrong about that, then you could end up alienating people from Jesus. And so I'm not exactly sure who you've been hearing from on that question, but that could be what's motivating them, a desire to protect the Christian faith from ridicule and to help reconcile more people to Jesus. All right. So the Catholic Church allows for, and by the way, I, I, again, I just want to reemphasize here, Jimmy, I think that you are representing more than just the Catholic Church. There is a significant part of evangelicalism that believes in what you're saying here. So, uh, and that is kind of <laughs> why we're having this discussion. But it's been said that if, um, if you add more to the scripture than what's there, in other words, if you don't believe in the literal seven days or the six days of creation, seventh day of rest, then you are allowed to plug in other things throughout Scripture. In other words, if you can't get the book of Genesis right, then the rest is left to some kind of insertion. Um, well, I would say that there's always a question of how Scripture is to be interpreted. And in order to uh, interpret it properly, we do end up appealing to more than just Scripture itself. We need to appeal, for example, to the meaning of words. If you're looking, let's say you're looking at the original text in Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic, you need to know what that language uh, means. You need to know what individual words mean. You need to know how the grammar is used. You need to know background aspects of their culture. That's one of the reasons that some of the most fascinating books you can read are biblical background books that help to describe the culture of the ancient world so you can understand what you're reading about better. And in doing that, you're appealing to information that's coming to you from outside Scripture as a way of understanding Scripture and making sure you're interpreting it correctly. In the same way, we can appeal to findings of science to help us correctly understand certain things in Scripture. And that's not uh, dis diminishing Scripture. It's still the Word of God expressed in the words of men, and because it's expressed in the words of men, we need to have recourse to other information to help us make sure that we're interpreting it correctly. If you just took a, a copy of the Bible in the original languages and gave it to someone who didn't speak Greek or Hebrew, they wouldn't, know, they wouldn't be able to figure out anything about what it meant. It's only by virtue of knowing the linguistic and cultural and and natural context of Scripture that we're able to make sense of it and interpret it properly. So is the argument, Jimmy, between the first and second day, or is the argument between uh, what God created as far as earth was concerned and all of its occupants up until the creation of man? Uh, because I think the clock pretty much starts with the creation of Adam, but for most part, but where is, where is the gap theory? I mean, where, is, where does it lie in your mind? Okay, well, the, uh, the gap theory is one of several common interpretations of Genesis 1. For those who may not be familiar with it, the gap theory is the idea that there was an initial creation, and then following that initial creation, there was a long period of time, uh, and then we get to the, uh, the six days of creation described in Genesis. And so, advocates of the gap theory, uh, I guess they may put it in where the gap falls in different places, but uh, it, 
my understanding is it's commonly put right after Genesis 1-1. So you have the initial statement that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, bang, that's the initial creation. And then you have a long period uh, following that. And then at some point, God says, okay, the earth is formless and void. I need to do something about that. And with Genesis 2, we're off and running. Um, that's not the view that I'm advocating. Uh, that I would, I would be critical of that view. I respect it because I think it's a sincere attempt to wrestle with the data of Scripture and to make sense of it, but that's not my interpretation. Um, instead, I would say that the, the six days as a whole are a literary device that are, that are not meant to be mapped chronologically onto the history of the universe. They're affirming what God did, but they're arranging that according to a symbolic structure based on the Hebrew week. Okay, so that's where you are personally? Okay. Yes. Uh, so that would put you in the old earth category? Yes, that's correct. Personally. Personally. Okay, so how old would, how old would you think the earth is then? Uh, the earth, the planet earth, it seems to be, uh, at least according to what modern science suggests, about 4.6 billion years old. And the universe as a whole seems to be about 13.8 billion years old. Okay. All right. Let me take a break. You're fascinating. <laughs> and I got a lot more to talk. And uh, so we'll be right back. And again, our special guest today, what a delight to have him, uh, Jimmy Aiken. He is a senior apologist at Catholic Answers. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Paulina, and I work at the Deaf TV. Did you know that when you support the Deaf TV, you have a profound impact, not only in our community, but around the world? It's your continued support that takes the inspiration and hope in the programs we produce and makes them available to the thousands of people who are watching these videos online every week. Help bring encouragement and hope to our valley and beyond by making a secure online donation today at our website, thedove.us. Okay, we're back, and our special guest today is uh, Jimmy Aiken. He is the senior apologist at Catholic Answers, and uh, talking to him about the uh, Catholic position, which also, I will have to say, represents a lot of the evangelical position of um, an old earth versus a young earth, and how we get there through the interpretation of the book of Genesis. By the way, Jimmy, do you have a website people want to connect with you? Yeah, uh, people can go to jimmyakin.com. That's my personal website. They can also find out more about where I work at catholic.com. Okay, good. All right. Um, boy, where do I go with this? Uh, um, so you are you are you are a, you basically are saying to a point, faith and science can agree. Yes. All truth is God's truth, and therefore, faith and science properly interpreted not only can agree, they must agree. Okay. Uh, and there's a lot of places they don't. I mean, I can look at, say, carbon dating and the second law of thermodynamics. What do you do with that? Well, uh, I don't see how, that, how carbon dating and the second law of thermodynamics disagree with the faith. Well, I mean... Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that some would believe, uh, as it relates to the um, issue of evolution, things are getting better, not worse. They're not decaying, they're actually improving. Okay, that's not the way an evolutionary biologist would characterize evolution. Um, an evolutionary biologist would not say that things are getting better or worse, simply that life adapts to the circumstances it finds itself in. Um, so as circumstances change, life forms will change, but that doesn't mean that they're getting intrinsically better or intrinsically worse. Interesting. Okay. Uh, that obviously could be challenged <laughs> and probably would be, but let me ask you this. Uh, so, in believing in the old earth, uh -huh. um, so would, would that put you in the gap theory? Is that where you... No, where no. You, uh, the view that I hold is, is what's known as the framework hypothesis. Uh, it's different than the gap theory. Um, Basically, one of the and if I if I could have just a moment or two to describe how that works, I'd that's, be happy to. No, that's the whole point. Go ahead. Okay, good. Um, one of the things that's been noted for centuries, this way predates the advent of modern science, is that Genesis one is structured in a particular way according to a particular framework. Uh, we initially read in verse one 
that God made the heavens and the earth, and then in which means He made everything. And then in verse two, we read that the earth is formless and void, or formless and empty, to translate it into a little bit more modern English. In Hebrew, the words that are used there are tohu for formless and bohu for empty or void. And a place that's formless and empty is not suitable for human habitation. It's not good for very much. It's not good for living things. And so God sets out over the next six days to fix those twin problems. First, he fixes the problem that the world is formless, and he does that by giving it form. On the first day, he creates uh, the day and separates the light from the darkness. So he's got a division there. That's the first introduction of form into the world, the separation of light from darkness. On the second day, he then separates the waters below from the waters above, giving rise to the sky and the sea. So he's added a new distinction into creation, a new element of form or structure. And then on the third day, he separates the waters below from themselves, giving rise to dry land. And so now we have the basic elements of the cosmos set up in a structural form. Um, they are, uh, we have day and night, sky and sea, and dry land. And so the earth is no longer formless. God has given it a form, but it's still empty. And so on the next three days, God goes back over the same three realms in the same order and populates them so that they're no longer empty. On day four, he goes to the sun and uh, he goes to the, uh, the, the day and the night and he populates them with the sun, the moon, and the stars. So now the day and the night are no longer empty. On day five, he goes back to the sky and the sea and he creates the birds and the fish. So now the sky and the sea are no longer empty. And then on the sixth day, he goes to the dry land again and he populates the dry land by creating the land animals and mankind. So he's now solved the emptiness problem of the world. The world's no longer formless. He fixed that on the first three days. Then he fixes the problem of the world's emptiness on the second three days by revisiting the same regions in the same order and giving them inhabitants. And so this is a, uh, from my perspective, this is a symbolic representation of how God created the world. He did so, he created all these things. He created the day and the night, the sky and the sea. He created the dry land. He created the birds and the fish and the stars and the sun and land animals and man. He created all of those things, but they've been arranged in a non-chronological order. All that Genesis 1 is really asserting is God made these things, but as a literary device, the author of Genesis has fitted them into the Hebrew work week, comparing God's labor to man's labor. The what, reason we know that this isn't literally the order in which it happened is actually contained in the text. If you look on day four, that's the day that God populates this, the day and the night by creating the sun, the moon, and the stars. Okay, so the sun is created on the fourth day. That's a clue that this is not speaking of a literal chronology. And the ancient audience would have recognized that because they knew just as well as we do that it's the sun that makes it day. Um, in fact, this is something the church fathers talk about repeatedly. Uh, they were aware that the sun is what makes it day, and so they talked about, well, if the sun makes it day, how is it we've had three days without the sun up to this point? And some of them, uh, I think, took a wrong turn at that point and said, okay, then maybe it's some kind of spiritual day. Or maybe there was some, maybe light was somehow disembodied before the sun. But really, what that is, is a signal from the author of Genesis to the reader that he's arranging things in a literary way rather than in a chronological way. So I would say science gives us the chronological account of how all this happened. You had the Big Bang and then the formation of the Earth and the development of life forms and so on over a long period. But Genesis gives us the theological understanding that this is not all just the work of random chance. This is the work of a supremely wise and good creator. Fascinating. 
um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out then what was day and night before sun and moon? Well, literally, literally, there wouldn't have been, um, at least there wouldn't have been day without the sun, because it's the fact the sun is oriented over our hemisphere that makes it day. In fact, I was looking this morning, there's a great quote from St. Basil of Caesarea, who was writing in the 300s, where he pointed out that's exactly what the earth, that's exactly what day is. It's when the sun is over our hemisphere. Um, the ancients, contrary to a lot of uh, rumor were not flat earthers. They knew that the earth was round, and they knew that it's the fact the sun is over our hemisphere that's what makes it daytime. So, again, what was day and night before we put the sun there? I mean, what was what happened there? What is the from, day? What's, is, it, is, is it just rhetorical from, from or what? My, yes. From my perspective, it's symbolic. It's a literary device. It's not meant to teach us anything about chronology. It's meant to just teach us God made all this. And it arranges the work of the Creator in a very beautiful way. Interesting. But we shouldn't say how long was the first day or what was the day on the calendar when the first day occurred in Genesis or the second or the third day or even the fourth, fifth, or sixth, because those aren't meant to be literal days. Those are just ways of conveying what the Creator did. Okay, so if you go to day four and he's putting the sun in the sky, mm -hmm. isn't the earth rotating then? And that would create a day? Yeah, it would, but we've, we've, we've established, or at least on, on, to my mind, we've established that these aren't literal days. And so it's pressing the text beyond what the text means to communicate to start asking questions of that nature. It's kind of like in Jesus' parables. If Jesus says, um, a man had two sons and they did this, it would be the wrong question to say, ooh, what was the man's name and where did he live? That's not the point. This is a parable. And in the same way, uh, Genesis 1 uses literary devices to communicate what the Creator did, but it's not meant to teach us about the chronology of exactly how this happened any more than Jesus' parables are meant to teach us about the names and addresses of the characters that figure in them. They're meant to teach truth on a different level. Okay. Uh, before I take another break, then I guess where in your uh, belief does the actual first day start? Meaning the beginning of time? Yeah. Well, I would guess that that's about 13.8 uh, billion years in the past, at least, since uh, science seems to indicate that the universe began in the Big Bang at, at that time, 13.8 uh, billion years ago, it wouldn't have been measured by the passing of the sun because the sun didn't exist, but that's when the first moment of time would have been, at least according to our current understanding. It could be there was something before the Big Bang, but if so, we haven't yet discovered it. Are you misunderstood my, uh, my question? My, I, I guess, let me lead you a little further here. Wouldn't okay. there have to be a literal day to sustain Adam? <laughs> Uh, sure, yeah. Humans, uh, humans are designed by God to live on the earth, and so mankind came into existence at some point within the last number of thousand years. Um, precisely how far back is going to depend on several different factors, but everybody agrees that humans have not been around for billions of years. We're much more recent than that. I understand that. I'm just trying to figure out that if if he created Adam and Eve, uh, man, I should say first, uh, Adam and Eve, um, and that was after he created the sun and the moon, mm -hmm. it would seem to me that the man clock would have started somewhere Morning. a little bit before Adam was created. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the man clock. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to figure out where the literally, literally the 24 hour day comes into play here. When does it, in your thinking, when does it start? Oh, well, 24 hour days go back quite some time. Now, actually the the length of the day changes very slightly over millions of years. So if you went back to the time of the dinosaurs, um, the day would be slightly off 24 hours, but it'd still be approximately 24 hours. So the <clears throat> the sun has been, uh, from an earthbound perspective, the sun's been revolving in the sky 
approximately every 24 hours for about four and a half billion years, about the age of the solar system. Interesting. All right. Uh, we're going to be joined by uh, John Mittendorf. Uh, it was his study that kind of sparked this conversation. He also worked with Answers in Genesis, which believes in the literal seven days. It'll be interesting to have you two just share different. We're not into a debate here, Jimmy. We're just into learning what you what a lot of people believe what you believe. Here's my question. That I can't get answered. I can't figure out why this topic is so contentious. <laughs> can you get from why, why is it so contentious? I, I think for a couple of reasons. Um, <clears throat> one is that uh, people are concerned, naturally, that Scripture be respected. Um, scripture is God's Word, it's true, and so when a way of understanding God's Word is proposed that people are not yet familiar with or not yet comfortable with, it can be a source of concern, and because nobody wants to see Scripture undermined. I don't, your other guest doesn't. We agree on that. I, I think it's, I, I may have a different interpretation of Scripture, but I thoroughly praise and laud his desire to see Scripture upheld and properly interpreted. And it's when people have the idea that, okay, here's this new interpretation that I'm not familiar with, it can be a source of concern, and people can even wonder, could science undermine the Christian faith? And that can be a source of concern for people, too. And so I think I think between the desire to protect the authority of Scripture and the desire to protect the Christian faith, both of which are very important, I think that's where some of the source of concern comes from. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, John Mittendorf is going to join us again. Uh, Jimmy uh, Aiken, he's the senior apologist at Catholic Answers, and you can go to jimmyaiken.com or you can go to catholic.com and look up his work there. Uh, I will say that he's not only representing um, the Catholic faith, but I think he also represents a lot of evangelicals who believe along the same line on this particular issue. There's a lot of other issues they don't agree on. So uh, what we're doing here is learning. We'll agree to disagree agreeably, but it's fascinating to find out just uh, the other points of view. So we'll be right back. We'll be joined by John Mittendorf. Hi, I'm Paula and I work at the Dove TV. Every day we get letters and emails from people who've been encouraged, blessed, and challenged by the programs on the Dove TV. But we couldn't do it without you. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to bring inspiration and hope to our community by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or call us at 541-776-5368. Okay, we're back and uh, being joined by uh, John Mittendorf. John uh, certainly no stranger to the Dove audience and uh, he does a lot of uh, research and apologetic discussions here on the Dove. He also works with Answers in Genesis and it was our original discussion on this whole subject of Genesis and in particular the six days of creation. Uh, that started all of this. Also, we're joined by, uh, and we're just delighted to have him with us today, uh, mm -hmm. senior apologist with Catholic Answers, uh, Jimmy Aiken. We've had him on before. And uh, again, Jimmy, thank you for your time. I know you got other things to do, but thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, I, I want to come back to the, the question that we, we kind of left with, uh, Jimmy, and, and, and maybe John can weigh in on this. The, the reason we're having you on is that as we went through um, this discussion on the six literal days of creation versus uh, the thought and belief that it wasn't literal, it could have been a whole lot longer, is that we did get a lot of response to that show uh, to the point where people were really upset with not allowing for longer periods of time in the Genesis account and felt that it was a stumbling block to people coming to faith. And I'm still trying to answer that question in my mind. And from your perspective, um, you are allowing for science to be a part of that discussion. Is, is that correct? I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to summarize it. Are you, is that right? Oh, we haven't got any audio in here. Yeah. Oh, there we go. There we go. Sorry oh, about that. All right, okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Did you hear my Sorry. question? 
Yes, I did. Okay. Um, yeah, science is part of that. Science can shed light on this question as it can on some others. It's not uh, questioning the Bible's authority. It's just saying, how, given that we have this information coming from science, what does that suggest about how we might want to read Scripture? I would say, though, that science is not the principal motivator here, at least for me. Um, the principal motivator for me is the fact that we were talking about a little earlier that the sun is not created until day four in Genesis, which, to my mind, makes it a clue that this is a literary le- rather than a literal chronology. All right. John, you want to respond to that? Yeah. Good morning, Jim. Howdy. <laughs> Howdy. Uh, very interesting listening uh, to your viewpoints this morning. And um, I think the big question, and uh, both you and Perry addressed it before I came on, was why the disagreement, uh, both in science and the church, on the reading of Genesis and the creation account. And I think from my perspective, I think really it's a collision of science and Scripture. When you look at Scripture, Scripture is God-breathed. Scripture is God's account of what He did in the past. And when I look at Scripture, I look at Scripture from the perception of Genesis 1 to the very last verse in Revelation, all of that is God's account, and it's true from the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation. There is no deviation in that. Now, why the big disagreement? And I think... um, there's, there's two avenues for this. One avenue is a uh, satanic avenue, that if Satan can introduce areas of disagreement in the church, then I think his work is being furthered. And you say, well, what do you mean by areas of disagreement? Well, a classic example would be, well, you know, Genesis really isn't correct. Uh, science has proven that, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then we start to get into a discussion of well, which is true. Is the Bible true or is science true? Uh, I think the other collision is, is that science, from my perspective, is a humanistic, godless um, um, ideology on basically, now I'm talking not all of science. science there's, there's very, very, very good avenues of science. Science has done a lot of good. But when it comes to creationism in the Bible, science is a humanistic, godless ideology. And so science, um, Darwinism is a classic example, uh, would prefer to define everything that we see about us came about from a godless, humanistic, naturalistic process that involves, that does not involve God at all. And that is their explanation from what we see. And of course you get in the Big Bang Theory and you get in the Darwinism and you get in all that, which of course is not in, um, in accordance with Scripture. And so when I answer, when I'm asked, when I do seminars and when I'm asked the question, why do we have such a disagreement in the church? I say basically to me it's the collision of two uh, worldviews. One worldview is a scriptural worldview. The other worldview is a scientific worldview. Now, a good question that came up when you and Perry were talking, can science and the Bible coexist? To a degree, yes, but I look at at sola scriptura. In other words, Bible always takes precedence over science. Now, what we're talking about basically is a whole other subject. When you talk about the age of the universe and the age of the earth and all that, yeah, we could get into why dating methods are not very reliable and all of that, and I think we don't really have time for that this morning. So that, that's a whole other subject. But basically, when I read Genesis, I read it as a literal account of what God did day one through day seven. Day one through six, He created. Day seventh, He rested. I also look at it from the perspective of, from the beginning, that was God's example to the Hebrews at that time, and also us, of the work week. You work six, you rest one. In fact, let me just real quick, Perry and Jim, read a literal translation of out of Genesis in Hebrew starting with verse 1. This is a direct translation. Starting with verse 5. One day morning was evening and was, and this sounds a little bit different because it's direct translation, second day morning and was evening and was third day morning and was evening and was fourth day morning and was evening and was fifth day morning and was evening and was sixth day morning, and was evening, and was the seventh on day God, and finished. He had made His work, His seventh day, and He rested. And through that, you notice that the first day has a cardinal number, one, 
and all the others have ordinal numbers. And what he is doing is he is defining a first day, a second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and seventh day. And that leads us right down the pathway to then um, a word that you're very, very familiar with in the Hebrew account in Genesis, and that's yom. What is the definition of yom? And when you look at the Hebrew account of yom, if yom is ever associated with an ordinal, a number, night and day, or evening, it always, always means a 24-hour literal day. And if you go back into the Hebrews, the Hebrew scholars, nationally speaking, and um, <clears throat> I'll just read a, a couple, and this is why virtually all Hebrews in the country today believe that when you read the Genesis account, it's talking about a seven-day, 24-day calendar day. And let me give you a couple examples. Uh, this is James Barr, past Regis Professor of Hebrew, Oxford University. Probably so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writer or writers of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey to their readers that creation took place in a series of six days, which were the same as the days of 24 hours we now experience in Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide. And of course, the Noah's Flood, that's, that's a whole other subject yeah. also, because a lot of people don't believe it was yeah. worldwide. Wow. Uh, uh, let me stop just yeah. for a second, Perry, yeah. and continue on. Uh, Hugh Williamson, who is a Kurgent, the current Regis Professor of Hebrew at Oxford University, almost exactly the same thing. I have not met any Hebrew professors who have had the slightest doubt about this unless they were already committed to some alternative by other considerations that do not arise from a straightforward reading of the Hebrew text as it stands. And, of course, you can go on. All right, Jimmy, um, that's a lot. <laughs> that's it was, wasn't it? All right, let me I, do this. I, I, I got to take a break. I hate to do this, but that'll give you time to respond, okay? Let me take a quick break. And I was watching your eyes and your emotions there as he was reading all of that, so I want you to respond. Let me take a quick break. Fascinating. I wish we had these guys for about a week. <laughs> We're not going to get through this. Let me take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dan and I work at the Dove TV. You know, compared to Portland, Seattle, and L.A., Medford might be considered a small market. But at the Dove, we're excited about the opportunity to make a big impact right here in our community. And you help make that happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us now by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or by phoning 541-776-5368. Okay, we're back. Uh, John Mittendorf's with us. He's joined us and uh, delighted to have with us today uh, Jimmy Aiken. He is uh, JimmyAiken.com is his website. Uh, he's uh, an apologist, senior apologist with uh, Catholic Answers and uh, not only representing the Catholic position, uh, but also I think he, uh, on this particular topic, represents the views of a lot of people. And again, let me just say this. Uh, Jimmy, overall, the Catholic's position is not dogmatic on this issue. You do, the Catholic's position is, I guess from the Vatican is, you can believe either way, is that right? Uh, yeah, now the magisterium prefers the symbolic interpretation of Genesis 1, but it doesn't insist on it. If, if a Catholic believes that it's literal, then you can believe that. That's not a matter the Church has defined dogmatically. Uh, we're going to run out of time, and I want to say first before we do, thank you for your time. Uh, we value it greatly. So John pretty much set up the basis from, from his perspective. Your response? Uh, I'd make three points. The first one is I think I have a better insight on why the recent discussion may have generated some heat. Um, if you accuse people of being dupes of Satan, that's going to generate heat. And so, you know, it's 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 just it's just a fact. You tell people that they're involved in a satanic deception, they're likely to give you some pushback. Um, in terms of uh, the accuracy of Genesis, one of the things that uh, I, some people will accuse Genesis of being inaccurate, but if you notice, I'm not one of those people. And so uh, Mr. Mittendorf or Pastor Mittendorf um, is interacting with a view other than mine and other than that of the Catholic Church and other than that of many evangelicals. It, 
if he's if he's uh, interacting with one that says Genesis is inaccurate. That's not what's being proposed here. It's a question of how is Genesis properly interpreted, not whether it's accurate. We're all agreed on that, at least here as Christians. Um, the third point I would make is he uh, spent a good bit of time interacting with what's known as the day-age hypothesis. According to the day-age hypothesis, the days of Genesis 1 represent ages, long periods of time, thousands or millions of years. And this is based on the fact that in some circumstances, the Hebrew word yom, which means day, can refer to a long period of time. Just like in English, I could talk about how things were back in Napoleon's day. It's not like there's a 24-hour period that was Napoleon's. It means the age of Napoleon. And so this Hebrew word had the same flexibility. Now, he argued uh, that in Genesis 1, it doesn't have that meaning, that it refers to a 24-hour day. Personally, I'd agree with that. I think it does, and there, for a different reason, not because of what Hebraists say about uh, cardinal and ordinal numbers in Genesis 1, but because we have the presentation of evening and morning. And whenever you have evening and morning, uh, Erev and Boker in Hebrew, uh, that's talking about a 24-hour day. So the days of Genesis 1 are depicted as 24-hour days corresponding to the 24-hour days of a Hebrew work week. But my contention would be that they are represented as 24-hour days, but they're symbols. So I'm not advocating the day-age hypothesis. I understand that is very popular with many people, but I would agree with, uh, with uh, your other guests that that's not what Genesis 1 is doing, that those are depicted as 24-hour days. The question is, are they meant to be literal or not? Okay, so this brings up uh, something I think we all agree on, that as it deals with the count of creation, we're not questioning the authority of Scripture, and we're certainly not questioning God's actual account of creation as it's there in Genesis. We agree that. I guess one of the problems that comes out of this, Jimmy, is that there seems seemingly an attempt as you insert science into the equation that science has an ulterior motive to replace the God factor, if I could put it that way. I understand that, and I think there's an element of truth there, but I think there's also an element of oversimplification. It's not, science is not monolithic. Science is a human activity, and some humans who are doing science do have anti-Christian motives, but others don't. And so it, it's, I think, an oversimplification to talk about science monolithically as if it had ulterior motives that are contrary to the Christian faith. Science, properly speaking, speaking, only exists in the actions of human beings, because science is a human activity, and you have to look at the individual humans and what they're claiming and what they're trying to do. Are they trying to use scientific techniques to help learn God's truth in nature and, and then use that as a way of helping shed additional light on God's Word in Scripture? Or are they trying to subvert God's Word in Scripture by doing something else contrary to the Christian faith? Those are two different activities. You got a quick question because we're going to run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the major point that uh, Jimmy and I um, are, are basically discussing is that I believe in a literal translation of Genesis, um, which is no, 20... I, I believe... Uh, I've been uh, literal translations, too. Translations are, can be very literal. I think they're very good to be literal. But then there's the question of what do the words mean? Are the words to be taken literally, not just translated literally, but interpreted literally? Right. So if I continue on with that, if, if, yeah. I, if I read Genesis, day one is 24 hours, day two is 24 hours, day three is 24 hours, and so on, until you get the seventh day and God rested. And so, of course, that brings in the discussion between the young earth old earth and uh, of course the huge division in the church you know is the universe young is it old is genesis read literally or do we take science do we insert science in there so science can better explain uh, genesis you know one thing jimmy uh, a verse that i find very very interesting in the bible is the sixth chapter of deuteronomy and in that uh, deuteronomy 6 7 and in the seventh verse that's where God charges the Israeli men while they were in the Sinai Desert for 40 years to teach the scriptures to their children mm -hmm. daily. Mm -hmm. And 
Scripture is designed really as, as an operational manual for us, uh, which I think you would, you would agree with. You know, that's our operational manual. And so when you look at then the Israeli men teaching the Scriptures to their children when it comes to Genesis, that does Genesis mean what it says or does it mean something else that it needs science to explain it better for our uh, illumination? And so I, I would hope that the Israeli men, when they were teaching their children, when it said day one, day two, day three, day four, well, you know, the scripture says day one, day two, day three, day four, but this is what it really means, that from our knowledge that we have today, it uh, really means different periods of time or long periods of time or whatever. Is it simplistic? Is it interpreted simplistic? Or does it need science to explain it? And uh, frankly, I don't think Genesis needs science to explain it at all. Well, I appreciate that, uh, and from a variety of viewpoints, um, I agree that Genesis does not need science to explain it in order to accomplish what Genesis was trying to accomplish. What Genesis was trying to accomplish is explaining that the Creator did all of this, and Genesis doesn't need science to accomplish that goal. But the text itself contains clues, like the creation of the sun on the fourth day, that indicate this is not meant to teach a literal chronology. And so I would say it's pressing Genesis beyond what it intends to do to try to get a chronology out of it, uh, whether a scientific one or another one. It's simply not operating on that level. It's teaching God's truth, but it's doing so in a literary way. And it would be a mistake to take that literally, just like it would be a mistake to take the parables of Jesus literally and insist on details like, well, what was the name of this father or what was the name of this field worker? Um, it's just not operating on that level, right. at least in my view. Okay. Uh, and I, I think we have to respect each other on that. Uh, I mean, this yeah. isn't anything to break fellowship over. And I don't think on either side is it a reason it's going to keep you out of heaven, is it? I sure hope not. <laughs> you know, there, there, is a, there is a great question, Perry. Uh, does the discussion we're having, Jimmy, does that affect our salvation? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But um, as we've talked about this morning, has it created a huge division in the church? Yes, it has. Jimmy, are you, uh, as an apologist uh, there with the Catholic Church, do you bump into this at all? Oh, sure. This question comes up regularly. It's something that's out there in, in our culture of, you know, what does science say about these issues and how, how is that to be squared with Scripture? And so this comes up for every stripe of Christianity. Yeah, because I think the one thing we have to keep very clear is that God did all the creating. It didn't happen by happenstance, right? Right. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Jimmy. Uh, you're a delight. And I uh, hopefully we've we've brought some clarity to this. I, I'm sure we could go on and on. There's a lot of other things we can talk about. Uh, but from your point of view, just as a summary, give me a one minute summary of your point of view. Uh, I would say that God teaches His truth in a variety of means. He teaches His truth in Scripture, which is divinely inspired and free from all error and uh, uses both in different passages, literal and literary ways of conveying God's truth. And we all need to respect Scripture and its authority, and we need to do our best to try to understand what God is saying, whether in a particular passage is he means it to be taken literally or whether he means us to understand it in a literary way. The first and best line of recourse for doing that is looking at the text itself for clues about how it's meant to be interpreted and understanding it in its original cultural context and what it's trying to do. When we do that with Genesis 1, we see that the author of Genesis has fitted the work of the Creator into the framework of a work week, as an ancient Hebrew would have experienced it. and modern science is able to supplement that picture by adding some additional information that the ancient audience didn't have, but that fundamentally does not contradict what's in Scripture. God's truth is the same, whether it's written in nature or written in the Bible. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. Again, for those who want to correspond with him, jimmyaiken.com, or you can get him there through uh, Catholic Answers. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, let's, let's continue on with this sometime, okay? Sounds great. All right. Thank, Thank you, Jimmy. You. All right. Thank you, John, for making my life interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, all right, we'll see you next time on Focus Today. Hi, I'm Jim, and I work at the Dub TV. 
Every weekday between 6 and 8 a.m., our award-winning news and sports team bring you the best morning show around. It's live, it's honest, and it's a whole lot of fun. And you help make it happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to air local programs that share your voice by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us.